hearts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Teach us, Lord, full obedience, holy Let's then seek together God's face in prayer. Let us just pray. Lord, we do pray on this Pentecost Sunday for a growing vision for outreach across our church. Give us a vision that will take us out of our comfort zones and lead us into new ways of serving you, led always by your Holy Spirit. Help us, we pray, to be agents of your love to all people in a world where there is much division and hate. Help us to be beacons of hope in a world that is sinking deeper into despair. Help us to be agents of your peace in a world that is torn apart by conflict and wars. As we come now to this time of worship, we pray that as we read from the scriptures, as we sing your praise, And as your word is opened up to us, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you might speak deep into all of our hearts and all of our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. We're going to come then to our scripture reading this morning. We're turning to the New Testament and to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, page one thousand. And 93, of course, the Pew Bibles aren't available. I keep forgetting that in these times of restrictions. But Acts chapter 2, and we're going to begin our reading at verse 1. Acts 2, verse 1, and let us hear God's word to us. And this is the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. Today, of course, is Pentecost Sunday, and we hear God's word. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native tongue? We can hear them speaking the Parthians, the Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, 
Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices, my body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of this fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, For the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. Amen. And we thank God for this reading from his own word of truth. I'm going to speak just now to our boys and girls. And I have a willing volunteer. Not sure how willing he is, but he's a volunteer anyhow. He's going to come up behind the, the protective screen here and help me out during this children's talk. And now, boys and girls, before we start our talk, I want to ask you a question. I know we have some in the congregation in various places. I want to ask you... If you were having, now I know you can't at the moment,
But in normal times, and we do pray and trust that we will get back to some normality soon, but if we were back in normal times, and maybe it was your birthday, okay, and you were going to have a party, what kind of things would you have at your birthday party? If you were allowed to have a birthday party tomorrow, if it was okay to have one, what kind of things would you have at your birthday party? Any volunteers want to tell me? Yes, great. A cake, yes. Is that what I heard? A cake, fantastic. Yeah, you can't have a party without cake. Sure you can't. And let me tell you, if it comes to normal times and you're able to invite me to come to your birthday party, if there's no cake, well, I'll be very disappointed. So what else? We've got cake, yes. Friends. Buns. And balloons. Okay, so we've got cake. Buns and balloons, okay? Let's get the order right. Cake, buns. And then we'll worry about the balloons after that. Isn't that right? So as long as we've got the cake and the buns. Any other things down here? Yep. Shout for me, sorry. Bouncy castle, right, okay. Yeah, I've been on a bouncy castle before and I'm never likely to go on one again. Let's just put it that way. So was my mum. My mum has been on a bouncy castle on the manse grounds some years ago when we had the Sunday school barbecue and I think everybody was scarred for life watching my mum trying to get out of the bouncy castle never mind me being really embarrassed so yeah I don't think I'll go in the bouncy castle but you might have one of those so those are some of the things you might have if you had a birthday party so today well this is a, a time of celebration because this is Pentecost Sunday and as Christians we want to celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit And we've got Alan to help us out here. And what Alan's going to do is, as I talk us through a little bit about what happened on the day of Pentecost, Alan's going to blow up his balloon. Just a little bit each time, Alan. Don't get too excited and blow it right up, okay? Just a little bit. And then when you're ready to finish and blow it right up until you think it's... Don't burst it, but, you know, right up, okay? So you know what you're doing, yeah? yeah? No, okay. That means we're okay if Alan says no. All right. So, boys and girls, we're going to learn something through this balloon, not Alan, the balloon, okay, (laughs) about the church. And today is a very special day, as I said, the day of Pentecost. And it was the day that God sent his Holy Spirit to breathe new life into his church so that his people would be able to proclaim his word and tell others about the love of Jesus. So, Alan, you've blown up a bit, thank you. Hold it up so we can all see that, all right? So the balloon's got a little bit of air in it. How did it start out, by the way, before Alan started to blow? What was it like? Yep. Small, it was flat. It's not right. It didn't look like a balloon. It wasn't terribly exciting. But it's starting, yes, Alan's showing you an example here. It was like the yellow one. It was flat. Didn't look like a balloon. Wasn't terribly exciting. But now things are starting to take shape. Okay. The church, you see, before the Holy Spirit came, was not witnessing and was not telling people about Jesus because they didn't really understand all that Jesus had come to do. The disciples were a bit unsure of God's great plan of salvation and they were a bit timid and a bit shy. But after the Holy Spirit breathed life into the church, okay, so there we are, the balloon's taking more shape, people began to tell everyone about the Lord Jesus Christ. They began to witness and tell other people about the love of Jesus. More. And as they spoke to people about Jesus, they began to hear about the love of God through Jesus Christ. And it tells us that thousands of people when they heard God's word being explained by Peter, who was filled with the Holy Spirit and led by the Holy Spirit, over 3,000 people came to trust in the Lord Jesus. Okay, Alan, do you want to tie it off? Is that as far as it's going to go, you think? Put a wee bit more on it then. Thank you. And Alan's going to tie it off. And as you can see, he's going to hold it up. And the balloon looks much more attractive, doesn't it? It's filled with air. It's vibrant. It has shape. It has purpose. And that reminds us, boys and girls, of how when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, the church became alive. And the church was doing the things that God expected and that God commanded. 
Thank you very much, Alan, for being our volunteer. Thank you. We appreciate it. So here's the thing. If we put all of our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we've asked him into our lives to be our saviour and friend, then the Holy Spirit lives and dwells within us. We don't have to wait like the disciples did for the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit already lives and dwells within us if we've trusted in Jesus Christ. And the Holy, the Holy Spirit is our helper. The Holy Spirit helps us to live for Jesus day by day, to become more like Jesus in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. And the Holy Spirit helps us to tell others about God's amazing love and about how we need to turn from sin and trust in Jesus, who can be our only saviour because he went all the way to the cross in our place and he took the punishment that we deserve for our sins at Calvary on the cross and he was raised to life again on the third day and now he reigns at the right hand of God the Father as our saviour, the one in whom we can put all of our faith and trust. Let's just pray for a moment or two. Lord God, we thank you for sending your Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. We thank you for breathing new life into the church. We thank you for giving your Holy Spirit to all who believe and trust in the Lord Jesus as their saviour and master and friend. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to pray again, this time praying for others as we remember those in our wider world, those in our community, and those in our church family. So let's come now to our prayers for others as we pray once more. Lord, on this Pentecost Sunday, we do indeed pray for a growing vision of outreach across our Presbyterian church. Especially we pray that congregations will be able to speak clearly about the good news at a time of great uncertainty regarding the future. We give you thanks for the many resources being currently produced by our church centrally to help us with outreach in the days that lie ahead in your will. As we think of our wider world today, we pray again for Israel and Palestine. We pray for the whole Gaza Strip. We have been really distressed by the pictures that we have watched on our television screens of the escalating conflict there. We thank you for the truce and hostilities between Israel and Palestine, but we pray that negotiations would be successful and that peace would reign. We pray today for Timor, Sumba and the nearby islands which were hit by a tropical cyclone at Easter. And we pray for Indonesia, for all affected and for our partners, the Evangelical Christian Church in Timor and the Christian Church in Sumba, as they seek to continue to help those who are grieving and those who suffered damage to their homes, their crops and their livelihoods. We pray today for the people of Nepal, where we're told that COVID-19 cases have been rising sharply. Lord God, we pray that in the midst of the, the onslaught of the virus, that you would protect your people there. And we pray for the health service there who are stretched. As we come a bit closer to home, we pray for the Reverend David Leach, who has been appointed as Professor of Ministry in our Theological College in Belfast. We pray that the Lord will use David as he takes up his post in August and we pray also for him and his family as their time of ministry in Union Road and the Comfort Congregations comes to an end. Help him to make that transition to a new post and to a new mode of service in our church. We pray for all from our church family here in the OC who are ill presently, some in hospital and some at home. May they know your gracious and healing touch to be upon them. And we pray that in your will, they might soon be restored to better health and strength. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.
Well, last Sunday, if you cast your mind back, you'll know that we were continuing to look at Ephesians chapter 4. And we looked at some of the attributes or the characteristics that ought to be in display in our hearts and in our lives as Christians. If we're to, in the words of the Apostle Paul, walk worthy of our calling as believers, then those attributes of being humble and gentle and patient and bearing with one another in love ought to be clearly evidenced in our lives. And we noted that all of these attributes, all of these characteristics were displayed by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry. We saw that our goal as believers is that day by day, in our attitudes and behavior towards others, in our thoughts, in our speech, in every area of our lives, in fact, we might become more like Christ. We might become more Christ-like. Of course, we also notice that all of this is possible only because we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit to help us, to mold us, and to shape us into those who are Christ-like in our everyday lives. We simply could not become more and more like Christ in our own strength and in our own ability. That would not be possible. And therefore, in this Pentecost Sunday, we're going to park our study in Ephesians chapter 4 and look together at the transformation brought about by the Holy Spirit in hearts and lives recorded for us in Acts chapter 2. And we'll also look at how the Holy Spirit wants to bring about great transformation in our lives as Christians. If we were to use one word to sum up all that happened on that day of Pentecost recorded for us in Acts chapter 2, it might be the word transformation. On the one hand, we are told of how the lives of the disciples, the early followers of Jesus, were transformed from those who were confused, who were timid, who were not very confident about telling others about their Christian faith, who became then on the day of Pentecost, bold and courageous in their proclamation of the gospel. What a transformation occurred. On the other hand, we also read about the lives of about 3,000 people who were in Jerusalem from many parts of the world at Pentecost and who, after hearing Peter's spirit-filled sermon, their lives were transformed. Their lives would never be the same again. So the day of Pentecost was, as we shall see, a day of much transformation. And we begin this morning by looking together at the transformation which occurred in the lives of the disciples. You see, up until the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, while it was certainly the case that the disciples and the early followers of Jesus, they believed with all of their hearts in Christ as their Lord and Savior. But it also has to be said that they were still very confused about a great many things. They didn't really fully understand why Jesus had come, what his mission was all about. They were still wondering if Jesus was going to set up an earthly kingdom. They had thought that he was going to to make his way into the great city of Jerusalem and he would overthrow the Romans who were oppressing them. And then he would establish his earthly kingdom, his earthly reign. But as we know, Christ did indeed go into Jerusalem. But the outcome was not what the disciples had expected. Yes, Jesus had tried to teach them and explain to them time and time again about his death and all that was lying ahead. But they didn't fully understand it. They couldn't grasp it. They couldn't get their heads around it. And so Jesus was nailed to a cross, a death of shame and great ridicule. Of course, he rose from the dead on the third day, as the scriptures tell us, and then he ascended into heaven a while after that. And at that time of his ascension, he said he would send someone to be with them at all times, someone who would be their helper and their comforter. And all of this meant that these disciples were puzzled. They were confused. And very understandably, they were far from being confident 
about sharing their faith with others. But then all of this changed with the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. In the chapter that we read from Acts, we're told that the disciples were were all together in the one place when the sound of a blowing wind came down from heaven. And what seemed to be tongues of fire settled on their heads. And they were all filled at that moment with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in all kinds of languages. Languages that they had never learned before. A crowd of people gathered together. People all over the Roman Empire. And that crowd of people listened as the disciples praised God and they preached the life-transforming good news of the gospel. All the people who listened in to that sermon by Peter, they were able to hear the message of the gospel being proclaimed to them in a very clear way. And as the disciples were speaking in all of these different languages and tongues, all these visitors in Jerusalem from across the Roman Empire, they could hear the message of Christ in their own native tongues. Why were all these visitors in Jerusalem at that particular time? Well, what we need to understand is that the festival of Pentecost was being observed. It was an agricultural festival. God had told the Jews that they were to gather in Jerusalem 50 days after the Passover to celebrate the harvest. And that's why so many visitors were crammed into the city of Jerusalem. And what happens? Peter stands up and he addresses this vast crowd of individuals and he is led by the Spirit in his speaking. And about 3,000, we're told, come to saving faith in Christ. Indeed, the day of Pentecost is often referred to as the birthday of the early church. Transformation, most certainly. No longer were these disciples confused. Now they understood God's great master plan of salvation. No longer were they timid and shy and reserved. And full of fear. They were transformed by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And now they spoke in public of their faith with great courage and with great passion. Think about the transformation that occurred in the lives of these disciples. Think about, for example, Peter. Peter who preached that sermon that led to those mass conversions. Remember how Peter had been arrested How he had followed along, sorry, Jesus had been arrested and how Peter had followed along at a distance, at a safe distance. He was in the courtyard of the high priest's house during the trial of Jesus before the Sanhedrin inside. And it was there that he was recognized by a lady. A lady who went up to him and said, surely you're one of these followers of Jesus. Surely I have noticed you before with him and and Peter denied it. He said, no, you must be mistaken. It's a, a case of mistaken identity. Then the woman went to others and she said, definitely, I recognize that man. And they came and they probed a bit further. Are you one of these followers of Jesus? And he, he swore, he took an oath. I don't know the man. I don't know what you're talking about. Finally, the bystanders began to point their fingers and accuse Peter because they recognized his Galilean accent. But again, Peter on the third occasion denied his Lord and Savior. He was crippled by fear and in a tight situation, he denies ever knowing the Lord Jesus. But now, just two months later, bear in mind, we see Peter standing up before a vast crowd of people And he speaks the message of the gospel with boldness, with passion, with great clarity. What a transformation. The difference, the anointing, the filling of the Holy Spirit. But let's also look at the transformation which occurred in the lives of those in the crowd who came to faith in Christ. You see, following Peter's spirit-filled sermon, we're told that about 3,000 people came to faith and were baptized 
They were introduced into the early church. Many of these people, as we've already said, were Jews from all over the Roman Empire. They didn't know Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. But that day, God took hold of their lives and their lives were radically transformed. Their whole way of looking at God, at themselves, at the world, at eternal life, all of that was changed. All of that was transformed in response to Peter's sermon. It was the Holy Spirit who opened up their eyes and their hearts and drew them to saving faith in Christ. Yes, there's no doubt about it. Pentecost can best be summed up in one word, that word being transformation. The lives of the disciples were transformed, no longer confused or timid or afraid. They now speak with boldness and passion. They become emboldened proclaimers of the gospel. The lives of those 3,000 or so individuals from all over the Roman Empire who did not believe in Jesus now have their eyes opened that they need to trust in him as their Lord and Savior. They can see that. They can understand that. Now they have peace with God. Now they have the assurance of sins forgiven. Now they know that the Lord will be with them throughout their life and even on into eternity. And one day they'll be with him forever in the glory and splendor of heaven. So what does this say to us today? Well, there are many people within our families, within our fellowship, within our community, within our province, within our circle of friends, across our world, who have not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I wonder, are we concerned about that if we say that we are Christians? We need to pray, surely, as believers, that the Lord would so move in hearts and lives by the power of the Holy Spirit that many would be drawn to Christ as their Lord and their Savior. But it's also the case that many of us as believers can just be like the disciples prior to Pentecost. We can be rather weak and timid with regards to being prepared to share our faith, to talk about our faith. And so we need to pray that the Lord remi would remind us that the Holy Spirit actually lives and dwells within us as believers. And the Holy Spirit will help us to share our faith. We can do that in many ways in these present times. We can share our faith in the posts that we put up on social media. We can maybe share a verse of scripture. If we can maybe share a sentence or two about how in these uncertain times we're trusting in the Lord and we're looking to him. We can bring a message of hope to people and people need to hear a message of hope today. But what I also want to say today to those of us who say that we are Christians is this. We need to pray that the Holy Spirit would radically transform our hearts and our lives so that we might become more and more like Christ, our Lord and Savior. That's something we were looking at over the last couple of Sundays, how as Christians we're to behave in our relationships with others, how we're to speak, how we're to think, that we need to stand out, we need to be different from those all around about us. But so often we just blend in with the crowd and there's nothing really different about our lives. Here's the problem. The problem is, if we're going to be absolutely truthful, we resist such transformation. We convince ourselves, even as Christians, that surely our lives don't need to be transformed that much. They don't need to be changed a great deal. But in our heart of hearts, we know that they do. We know that we still have sinful habits that need to be rooted out of our lives. We know that there are times when, if truth be told, we're utterly selfish and self-centered in our dealings with others, always wanting our way. We know that if truth be told, there are times when we completely misunderstand what God is telling us in his word. We know for sure that we fail to grasp great opportunities to share our faith with others. 
It is true that some of us here today and some of us who are listening in are Christians. We can identify that there was a time when in response to God's call upon our hearts and our lives, we turned from our sin and we trusted in Christ for salvation. We know that we belong to the Lord. We know that we are his children and that one day we'll be with him forever in heaven. But here's what we also need to grasp. We still need to be transformed. You see, becoming a Christian isn't about simply getting a ticket to heaven one day. It isn't about simply saying, right, I've asked the Lord into my life. One day I'll be in heaven. Now I just rest upon my laurels and wait for that day. We're to live a life here and now for the glory of the Lord. We need to become more and more the people that God wants us to be. We need to become day and daily in our thoughts, our words, our actions, more and more like our Savior. And of course, we might ask, how is this possible? On Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came directly to those early disciples in a great wind in tongues of fire, and that's what gave them the courage to speak up, to stand out, to be different, to be a witness. But today, God works in a very different way. He no longer comes with a loud sound of a wind or with what looks like tongues of fire. God comes today to us as believers. The very moment of our conversion, the very moment that we turn and trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within our hearts and lives. It's not that as believers we have to wait until one day in a spectacular way the Spirit fills us and suddenly we can go out and be different in the world. The moment we accept Christ into our hearts and lives, the Spirit takes up residence. And of course, we have the Spirit dwelling within us to help us strive day by day to be obedient to the Lord, to be obedient to his word, to be faithful to him in every area of our lives. Not only to be hearers of God's word, but also doers. We can be sure that the Spirit lives and dwells within us, and that if we are obedient to the Lord and open to his leading and guiding in our lives, then the Spirit will mold us, shape us, conform us into the people that we really ought to be. The Holy Spirit works within our hearts and lives as believers to strengthen our faith, to increase our love for Christ our Lord and Savior, and what's more, to make sure that we love one another. And loving one another is one of the signs that we truly belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, as believers we do very well to pray in the words of the hymn writer. And we're going to sing this hymn in a moment or two at the end of our service. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. Let the presence of the risen Lord come renew my heart and make me whole. Are we open today to that renewal? To having our lives transformed in a radical way? By the work of the Spirit. Cause your word, the hymn writer says, to come alive in me. Give me faith for what I cannot see. Give me passion for your purity. Holy Spirit, breathe new life in me. Holy Spirit, come abide within. May your joy be seen in all I do. Love enough to cover every sin. In each thought and deed and attitude. Kindness to the greatest and the least. Gentleness that sows the path of peace. Turn my strivings into works of grace. Breath of God, show Christ in all I do. On this Pentecost Sunday, it behoves us who say that we are Christians to turn our lives completely over to the Lord, to ask for his spirit to be at work within us, that we might become more and more Christ-like, and that others might see the difference that Jesus makes in us. Let us pray. 
Lord, we thank you for this Pentecost Sunday, a day when we are reminded of the transformation that came about in the hearts and lives of those early disciples. Once they were afraid, timid, unsure of what their faith was all about, unsure of God's plans and purposes. But then the Spirit came upon them and they became emboldened in their witness, filled with passion, filled with courage, going out into the world to share the good news of Christ and his kingdom. Lord, we pray that you would make us your people those with boldness and courage and passion in our sharing of our faith with others in these days. But we also can't help but notice the transformation of over 3,000 lives on that day. Those who were caught up in their religion and following all that their religion taught, but yet they didn't know Christ as their personal saviour. And suddenly their eyes were opened. As Peter spoke, led by the Spirit, they could see and they could understand their need for the Savior and they trusted in Christ and came into the church. Lord God, we pray that many in our community, many in our family, many in our fellowship, many across our world would come to know and trust in the Lord as their Savior. And Lord God, for those of us who would profess faith in the Lord Jesus today, we thank you that one day we have the assurance of being with you for all eternity in heaven. But here and now, we're to live for you. Lord, forgive us for when our walk does not match our talk. We pray that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit who lives and dwells within us and renew our hearts and make us whole. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to come then to our final hymn, so appropriate on this Pentecost Sunday. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. I'm not quite sure if we've sung it here in church before. Uh, it seems like it might have been some time ago, but uh, it certainly will be led from the front. And even if we don't know all of the words or know the chin, let's look at the words on the screen and let's make them our prayer if we know the Lord today. Holy Spirit. Your work and prize 
lead us on the road of sacrifice, that in unity the face of Christ may be clear for all the world to see. Let's just be seated for a moment or two as I make uh, some brief announcements want to make that announcement regarding our need for help with the piano and organ. If you know of anyone who might be able to help us out at this time, or indeed with our music in any way, please do get in touch with me as soon as you can. Also, I have two books here this morning, one entitled The Twelve Chosen Disciples and Lessons from Their Lives. The second, The I Will Promises of Christ, Promises Giving Assurance in Times of Great Uncertainty. Uh, and especially this one, the promises of Christ in times of uncertainty, is very helpful in these times that we're going through at the moment. These books are both written by the Reverend Ian Fleck, and I'm sure you remember Ian coming uh, to preach when I was off uh, in recent times. Uh, Ian's a retired minister now living in Balamina, and he helps as a, a pastoral visitor uh, over in First Ahokal Congregation. So Ian has produced these two books the Twelve Chosen Disciples, Lessons from Their Lives some time ago, but this is his more recent book, The I Will Promises of Christ. And I really commend these books to you, especially uh, this one here for these times in which we're living. They're priced at eight pounds each. Uh, you'll notice the price is slightly dearer in the back, but Ian tells me that I can tell you that they're eight pounds each and the money will all go to mission, uh, overseas mission. As you know, Ian served for some time along with his wife, Sandra, as missionaries in Nigeria. Uh, so the money will be going to mission work, a very good cause, and the books will benefit you, I truly believe. And so if you would like to purchase both books or one of the books, please get in touch with me. Uh, we have 10 copies of each, but I can get more if they're required. Uh, so Ian gave me 10 to start us off, and uh, if there are any more needed, I can order those from him directly. Uh, so I have the books in the manse at the moment, if you would really like one, if you'd be keen to have one of these books, ring me at the manse, get in touch with me in the mobile, and in a socially distanced way, I'll deliver it uh, to your door, and you can have that copy. Then also just to say, uh, uh, the Holiday Bible Club in August, first week in August, Melissa is helping to head up and coordinate this outreach amongst our boys and girls, but also our young people as well of secondary school age. I'm just checking, I haven't been speaking to Melissa this week, do you still need some help or, yeah, you do. So Melissa would still need some help and uh, if you'd be willing to help her in any way, she has lots of tasks uh, that you can do or, or assist with during that week of outreach. It won't be face-to-face, -face, it'll be uh, via the medium of social media and through the internet. But uh, if you have a chat with Melissa or if you contact me, I'll pass your details on to Melissa also. And then uh, just to say that our midweek meeting will be at the usual time of 8 o'clock, YouTube, Facebook, and the dial-in telephone service Wednesday night at 8. And uh, we'll have our Zoom prayer time at 9 o'clock onwards. Really encourage you to join with us for that time of prayer. I won't be able to be there personally, but Amy plans to be there to help with that. I'll be involved with uh, some of the men from our congregation in their training for the eldership on Wednesday evening via Zoom. Uh, so I'll not be able to be there, but I know that you'll be in capable hands with the Amy there for that Zoom prayer time. I think these are all of our announcements. We, we stand then for the benediction. Let's just stand. So Lord, we pray that you might send us out from this place to truly be those who show by our lives that we belong to you, that we might remember that the Holy Spirit lives and dwells within us if we have trusted in Christ and you will give us the strength and the help that we need to be truly your disciples, your witnesses, and those whose lives speak loudly for the Lord. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, the fellowship, communion, presence of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and even forevermore. Amen. <laughs>